and leadership, the role of SMS Collective. I think SMS Collective is really letting government down. And I hope most of you here are SMS to lead from most SMS members. They, they collude with staff, they collude with unions at different levels, and then they, they, they just don't have the commitment. I don't know whether it's a competency issue or a capability issue. They just don't have the commitment to hold people accountable for their actions. So SMS members will allow themselves to be bullied by people below them. And I'm saying SMS at different levels because SMS is a broad category. And I think whatever interventions that must be done must be done because our, I mean, the, our SMS needs to step up a little bit. We really need to step up a little bit and lead because there's, there's, it's, there's a reason why we have a competency for SMS that looks at strategic leadership capability. It's because it is known that you are going to be expected to lead. And when you lead, you are not going to be liked by people all the time. And if you are a person at SMS who wants to be liked, you are going to compromise the organization so that you are liked by people who are non-performers, by people who are corrupt, by people who are incompetent, who are unable to deliver on their responsibilities. You will, be, you will allow yourself to be bullied by them. You will allow yourself to collude with them. You will not have the strength to stand up at against labor when you need to stand up. Instead, you will go and speak with labor in corners. And um, so, so, so we, have this, we have this poor ethic in terms of leadership at SMS level. And I think we have a responsibility, each and every one of us, to ask ourselves what leadership role are we playing as individuals first? Because we all applied as individuals in these jobs. Uh, because if we if we if we attempt a little bit to change the leadership role that we are playing and to improve on the leadership role that we are playing, then we are going to contribute in changing the culture of the organisation. And I hear everybody blaming the culture, the culture. We are the ones who have created the culture, and we are the ones. Now we must go get consultants to come and change and help us change the culture that we created ourselves. We are the ones who created this particular culture and we are the ones who have to change the culture into the culture that we want in the public service. There is certainly poor service delivery. Productivity seems to be very low. Uh, we tick boxes when we do performance, when we do annual performance plans, people want to target the, the, the easiest things to achieve and the things that are not going to make them stretch themselves uh, in most instances. And um, there's wastage in certain sectors, duplication and underutilization of our human resources. You will have people who are employed to do labor relations in departments, but you will have heads of departments and whoever ignoring those people and either using legal or bringing in separate capability. Just an example, that's wastage of resources that you already have in the department. Uh, you also have... Um, People who are called, who are referred as not wanting to work in the departments. I mean, I don't know. I think every HOD, every DG, and maybe every SMS member, you've experienced people who, whose attitude is bad. Who are angry and you don't know why they are angry. But they are angry, they don't want to work, they want to challenge everything. And it's not a problem to challenge everything as long as you also do your work because you are employed to do to deliver on certain things. But so you are caught up in this cycle of people who are just not committed and not prepared to work and will find every reason and every excuse not to do their work. So if at an SMS level we are like this, can you imagine below us what's gonna happen? Because as leaders, we are not stepping up to our leadership roles. The MMS below us is, is taking things from us and those below SMS are also taking, so the entire system will collapse. And we will stand in platforms and complain and complain, but these things, uh, you can do so much training, but the issue is about, you know, respecting the public service and operating according to our own values, adopting those values and leaving them and, working and, and making it possible to understand those values and how you translate them in your, in your world of work. Uh, so, so for me, those challenges, I thought I must spend some time because 
I think if we leave this conference without talking about some of these things, we are going to be fooling ourselves. So I've decided to be very frank around some of those anecdotal experiences as well as things that I've observed in the course of doing work in this capacity and even capacities before this one. I'm not going to spend much here, but uh, my, my guys who, 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 who prepared this submission insist, uh, or this presentation insist that there's something called work-life balance. I don't know, I've never experienced it personally. I don't know if there's any woman, firstly, who has experienced it. I don't know, but if you have, I want to say that I respect you. Uh, probably it's easier for men to, um, uh, to experience it. I don't know, I've never lived, I've never been in the shoes of a man. But uh, 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 what I know is that as a mother, as a partner, as a child, as a family member, as an aunt, I have to drop certain things. As a worker, I have to drop certain things to do certain things in my day. So if you call that work-life balance, sometimes I have to leave work early to go to the school of my child and be part of activities that take place in school. Sometimes I have to ignore my children and not see them like, since uh, Tuesday, I woke up at I left my house at 4.30 a.m. to go to Cape Town, and I took a flight back at 9 p.m. So what, when I got home around 12, or quarter to 12, my kids were sleeping. When I left in the morning, they were sleeping. Yesterday morning, I had to wake up. At least I had an opportunity to go with them to school. And uh, But when I came back, I had to, an opportunity to go with them to school because I had a, a meeting with a school teacher for one of the kids. So when I came back, I came back very late because when I left here, I went to another engagement which uh, released me like at half past nine. So when I came home, they were already sleeping. This morning, I woke up very early and left. Um, uh, they were still sleeping. So, so that balance it is definitely by those standards not there because I should be seeing them every day and I should be cooking for them as their mother and I should be checking on them as their mother. So those who can master the balance, all the best. But personally, I've given up on it. I know that at times I have to drop some ball in order to pick up some ball. But um, how I look at which ball I drop then and which ball is informed by a number of factors. The, just in terms of the numbers, 1.2 million, we know male employees in the public service are 38% and female employees are 62%. So if you look at the global picture, 62% females is um, uh, it's like doing very well. These statistics are from last year, isn't it? As of January 2023. Okay, so there's been no change, basically. Male employees, now you flip the triangle around, looking at SMS, male employees at 56%, female employees at 43%. We seem to be really struggling with the transformation issues around this, and I hope we can have a chat about this and how we address this particular issue. Now, there's the, this thing that is discussed uh, in media every day around qualifications of SMS. We thought that we must share some information with you on this. We have 9,339 SMS members out of 1.2 million public servants. 1,926 SMS members are not meeting requirements as at 31st January 2023. I asked them to give me percentages, they haven't, and I don't know how to calculate percentages myself. Uh, national government has a record of 889 SMS members who do not meet qualifications. So which one is 0 0.7? SMS is 0.7% of the public servant. So when people are saying we're having management, just give them the global figure because the global figure is 0.7%. Um, However, there could be pockets where we're heavy internally in departments on management, especially departments that deal with police and regulatory matters. Majority of the 1,400 were appointed, or majority of the 
1,926 that are not qualify, qualifying, 1,400 of them were appointed pre-2016. I did raise this yesterday. That the number of them were, were appointed before the, the, the directives that imposed minimum standards. So they were appointed according to the open process that was there then. It would be useful to go back and see out of these 1,400, how many of them have improved their qualifications. Maybe they have improved them, but they are not in the system. I don't know. And then 526 were appointed after 2016. So these are irregular appointments. These 526 appointed after 2016 are irregular appointments because they did not meet the requirements of the directive that was issued and the regulations that were issued in 2016. Since 2021, the records of 809 SMS members were updated on PESAL. So you would have seen earlier when the news broke on this, the numbers were higher. So we've been writing to departments to say, please update on PESAL, please update on PESAL. So about 809 SMS members were updated on PESAL since January, since 2021. The Department of Justice and Constitutional De Development, and I think the DG there said it's NPA, it's not them. So um, I just want to put a disclaimer there so that if he is listening to me, he knows I mentioned that he did say it's not them. They have the largest number of uh, SMS members who do not meet qualifications or who do not meet requirements at 244. Gauteng and, has the largest number of those not meeting requirements at 268. We don't know whether it's whether they are not updating, updating PESAL or it's because indeed those people are there. We've, we've, re, we've reminded departments about four or five times to update PESAL. So this is just at SMS level. I assume this year we're going to dive deeper into non-SMS in terms of these particular statistics. The majority are above 55 years old. Again, I said colleagues must try and disaggregate this data. How many, because majority doesn't help, how many are above 55 years? Because those who are above 55 years are looking at exit in the public service. So we may not want to invest much on them, but there are those who are below 55 years who still have long to stay in the public service. The next slide looks at, <coughs> looks at the vacancy rate. Uh, I don't know if there's any colleagues from the Eastern Cape here. Nikona Bakaya, I, you are not doing well on recruitment, on filling vacancies. And you know, I'm, this hurts me because I was in the province, um, I think last year, early last year, and we raised the issue of vacancies, but it's still continuing. The Eastern Cape is at 16.8% of vacancies. And uh, you can see the lowest is Free State. Free State has always performed below the 10% um, in terms of vacancy management. Gauteng as well is doing well there. Um, Bumalanga is also doing well. And <clears throat> the rest are above 10%, including national departments. National departments are standing at, I don't know, I can't see the data for national departments here. It's just provinces. Is it here? Okay, I don't see it. Eh? Oh, it's in the next slide. Okay. So as you can see, so we are highlighting that health and education has the largest vacancies at 112,455, which is 68% of total number of vacant positions. And I think the slides we didn't include is, are those that break down even these vacancies and at health and education because they will tell you that uh, we have lots of vacancies at, 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 at frontline service and service delivery level. We have high numbers of OSD posts that are not filled in health and to some extent in education. This is just the information on ICT. I'm not gonna spend time on it, but we do research on an annual basis that looks at ICT spending, that looks at um, um, personnel in IT, I, ICT in the, in, the, in the departments. And I want just to highlight an area that relates to um, 
the fact that a large ICT projects struggle to reach completion and ICT systems largely are operating in silos and we lack integration. We also don't use our licenses fully that we pay for. I get a shock every time I discover what we can do through our Microsoft licenses as an example. From an HR perspective or ICT capacity, out of this number of employees, we always round it to 1.2 million. I think this 1.31 is just the permanent ones uh, who are in, in, in PESAL, but if you include the other categories, we are rounded to 2 million. But out of the 1.134 permanent employees, if you like, we have 0.3% of them in ICT functions. And their skills base is also suspect, some of them, in ICT functions. Because remember in the past, if you could just open a computer, you were likely to be sent to the IT department. If you could type, you were likely to be sent to the IT department. So you, so imagine the, the transformation, the digital transformation that we have to implement with this small number of people who are knowledgeable in IT. And even this number, we're not sure if all of them are knowledgeable in IT. There's something there that uh, the AG has said that you must read about weak controls and vulnerability. I think from a professionalization point of view, we've spoken enough about the professionalization, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it, except to say that, remember that this, um, the idea around professionalism is that we, we, we want to build effective leaders. We want to ensure that public servants do what is right, whether somebody is watching or is not watching. We want to improve the quality of service that we deliver. And we, we want public servants who take responsibility for their work, where there's con consequence management, where the values are leading the, the, the public servant and, and, and how they en engage with the work that they do and their responsibilities. Uh, the values of honesty as well are some of the things that uh, we talk to. And more importantly, also the public trust, building the trust of the public on the state, which is, I think, at a high time, at, at a high low currently. So the framework colleagues, I'm sure all of you have seen it and you don't want me to spend more time on it, but it is in this presentation, which I hope they will send to you. We have highlighted uh, the framework here, but I want to jump these slides. Yes, I'm going to jump this slide as well, but it just shows you some of the work we're doing in terms of enhancing, uh, I mean, strengthening the functionality of public administration. We have an MOU with uh, with AG, which is going to assess us to audit some of the areas that we know you always breach as people who are in HR, um, together with your political principles and your DGs. We know those areas. You write to us, you ask for a deviation, we decline it, but we still see that the person you wanted to appoint is still in the system. How? We don't know when we've declined the deviation. So all those uh, deviations that we decline, and um, um, also the structures that people want to bloat at times. We're submitting all those things to AG because from an audit perspective, they're going to sample and we'll also advise on areas of sampling because we know we keep a record of what has come from each department and what goes out from our side as DPSA. So please take that message to your teachers and your ministers that it's it's not about HR doing everything that needs to be that the minister or DG wants. It must be in line with the regulations and 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 no matter the pressure, at the end we have to do the right thing. We just also sampled a slide on training. You know that uh, we 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 have a, a a directive on using is it one percent or one point five percent? One percent of the salary bill. Uh, for training of uh, public servants. That's why many of you have so many degrees, uh, because you, you, you are able to apply for bursaries and hopefully get them and train. But look at the performance of departments in this area. We are not spending very well. Uh, we have only spent, this is the 2021-22 financial year, isn't it? We have spent around 2 billion of the 4 billion. 
that we we that is allocated for training in the public service so what departments do is they allocate the money because it's mandatory at the beginning of the financial year it's mandatory one percent they allocate it towards the third fourth quarter they reprioritize that money to do other things in the department or they just underspend they don't spend the money so we need to watch this out because um I hope that these departments that are not spending the money for training and development uh, are perfect, have a perfect system in terms of running. Everybody is skilled, everybody is competent in the department. Because remember, we can also do skills training from this man. I mean, we can, it doesn't have to be decreased, decreased all the time for people. There's also development work that must be done. Yes, I've, I've highlighted this on the a training budget, yes, four billion is budgeted for 2021-22. Was budgeted and only 2.1 billion was utilized. Only three provinces are compliant to a minimum of one percent training budget: Free State, Limpopo, and Northwest. Only the Western Cape spends one percent of the budget. And um, currently there is a gap that exists between the skills required and the skills that are suitable, that are available. There are some categories of positions that we have identified as being hard to fill, uh, positions or vacancies. Uh, the occupations that are highlighted here uh, include senior government officials, program or project managers, general manager in the public sector, public service, policy and planning managers, organization and methods analysts. I don't know why we struggle with policy and planning managers when we have so many public management graduates in the public service. I'm not sure what's happening there, professors. Um, forensic accounting, investigative accounting, personnel, human resource managers, Senior government managers, okay, this is a repeat. Financial managers, research and development managers, ICT systems analysts, information systems audit or IT audit, financial accountant, procurement officers. So I'm told that these are positions that are hard to fill in the public service according to PCTA. A total of 17,218 tens and 4,913 learners were recruited in the reporting period of 21-22. A total of 11,937 bursaries were awarded to serving staff members and 4,539 bursaries were awarded to non-staff members. 6,075 employees underwent compulsory induction program within their year of probation. I think this is the one that is done by NSG. So thank you, Principal. But what they haven't done is to show 6,075 of how many. But I mean 6,075 is still a, a good number. 304 employees who did not possess a metric certificate, NQF level 4, enrolled for adult education and training program. There is a need to conduct a tracer study on the whereabouts of the non-public service beneficiaries of the bursaries and provide data on the MNE and annual HRD reports. There is also a need to, Im to track impact on productivity. Okay, I'm gonna jump that slide on the continuum of human resource management. I think you should know it. Um, just on what's next in terms of uh, professionalization, uh, we have a priority area on building, on, on cutting the red tape. And I did indicate that our, <clears throat> our regulations are under review and, we, and the policy directives, we should be uh, issuing a handbook early in the financial year with the new regulations and updated directives. Positioning HR as strategic rather than compliance function. There's a number of things we are doing there. There's research work that is being done on future of uh, work in public service. PCTA has been kind enough to, uh, to support this work and bring in partnerships from universities. Integrated human resource strategy, I've spoken about it earlier on. 
training of HR managers and teams on strategic HR, automation of HR processes is an emergency. This is an emergency we don't have. It's a, it's a big risk in the public service, but yeah, it's one of those depressing things, I must confess, because the IFMS, which was supposed to do this job, I sometimes don't know what's happening with it. Um, we had a deadline of uh, 1st of April to roll out the IFMS uh, e-recruitment e system for the public service, but I doubt it's going to happen because there's been lots of stops and goes, stop and goes in the process. We, the other area is just around building a decisive and resilient values-driven leadership in the public service. We're talking about the revitalized but to be less, uh, and introducing standards and integrating constitutional values and principles in service delivery, accountability and consequences management, management of career incidents of HODs, retention of HODs, there's work there that's done already, a value-based program targeting public service. I think that um, uh, uh, the principal at NSG, together with all these professors that are here, can help us the, to pull together a program that we can make it compulsory for SMS, just focusing on the values and how we live these values as professionals in terms of our work. I think that's going to be an important intervention. We have to keep on harping on values so that they are just on the face of the people. So uh, it would be useful if such a program can be rolled out to everybody. And if I may suggest, Principal, that perhaps it becomes a hybrid. It's not only fully online, but there's uh, sessions where people interact and share information and share experiences as well as share ideas. Just in terms of building an ethical state, of course, lifestyle audits are being rolled out in the public service. The, some of your departments and provinces are not cooperating, but it's mandatory, so we will then uh, have to follow that up. Uh, protection of whistleblowers, just access to witness protection for whistleblowers in the public service uh, uh, is, 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 a, is a critical issue. I mean, you've seen the crisis around whistleblowers uh, who end up being um, desperate and out of work and I, I'm, I'm talking about legitimate whistleblowers, not these ones who are just, uh, you know, uh, abusing the system. Because there's also lots of abuse of the system in terms of whistleblowing. Improvements in discipline management, that is looking at new strategies and codes, values-based public service, encouraging and preventing, encouraging prevention and self-regulation. So if you talk about corruption, for instance, what are we doing to to really strengthen prevention in terms of corruption. Yes, we have all these codes and all these rules that nobody is respecting and is implementing. So what's next? What are we doing to ensure that people self-regulate? Productivity, I'm not going to say much about that. Um, ICT as well, I think I've shared already, but we do need to strengthen the role of CIOs in the public service and professionalize the role of CIOs in the public service. I think we know human resources is central in terms of our work. So things like filling of vacancies and having a project approach on those things is very important. Uh, I just wanted to highlight some of these things we talk about when we talk about a values-based public service. It must be responsive. It must, uh, there must be integrity. There must be impartiality. There must be accountability, respect, leadership, human resources. I think in our conversation, we've touched on all these things. Just in terms of concluding remarks, I want to highlight that there is a need to recruit appropriate HR skills and move into HR partnering model across government as part of this idea of a strategic HR. There is a need to strengthen induction and probationary practices in the public service. Even when people are on probation, circulating them around the department or around the public service to even learn more. Even after being appointed, there are people who stay in one position as a director for 15 or 20 years in one department. So why are we not circulating people around in the system so that they can also learn new cultures and be exposed to different innovative ways of doing things other than how they do things for 20, for 20 years or so? Um, also, this idea of doing the right thing and provide meaningful, honest advice. And I think it's an issue that 
we must look at. Uh, you know, there are people. Uh, now we are we are we are approaching a, a, a period where there's gonna be changes in government. I mean, if the reshuffle takes place, when it takes place, I don't know who's gonna be my minister. But you know, my biggest anxiety is what. It's not even about who is going to be my biggest minister. My biggest anxiety is about Emililo, fires that I have to manage when the new minister arrives. Because everybody, those who report to me and those who don't report to me, will try to be the first ones to talk to minister and say whatever they want to say about me, as an example, as a head of department. So by the time I meet the minister and try to present the department, the minister already knows so much gossip about me. Whether it's correct or not, it's immaterial, but the, it depends how mature that minister is in order to process the things that they hear and etc. And these things become a grounding for, for compromised relations. And when there's compromised relations and there's tension in the political administrative interface, it becomes difficult for the department to, 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 to perform as a unified unit. Because if a department is not a unified unit, it's going to struggle to perform. So my anxiety is not who is the minister who's going to come or whether the current minister is staying because I am a professional, I will work with any minister. So, but my anxiety is about now having to answer things I've answered with the previous three ministers. I've answered with Minister Mtunu, I've answered with Minister Ayanda, I've answered with Minister um, with Minister Nguyen. Now I must answer these allegations again. But what I like is that the allegations always come in the same format. So I'll just have to go and dust the responses I've done in the past and send to the minister. That's what I like about them. But it's, it's not a good space for us as HODs because you always have to watch out your back. You know, when you are working and you are watching your back all the time, it's not a good space. But uh, I'm just saying that, so from an advice point of view, it's important that HR plays a meaningful role to advise DGs, political heads, and everybody that they interface with. Do not succumb to the pressure. Do not succumb to the pressure of the DG or the minister saying, I want it like this. If it can be done like this, you have to respectfully advise the minister that it can be done like this. And I must say, I always say in the public service, I've worked in a number of places, but there's a few things I want to acknowledge about DPSA. And I think one of them, I've said this, is their supply chain management. It's so strict that you can end up you know, ignoring your project and not doing it because yay, they go through the tears, which is good because that's what we want. So they focus, they sometimes there's a complaint that they are not flexible. I don't know if they can be flexible in terms of uh, managing supply chain work, but those guys are very committed to their work. And the other people I want to acknowledge, I see Karin is here, HR. I want to acknowledge one part of HR. I'm not doing a computer, I'm not a doing performance assessment, Karin, but I just want to say, you know, sometimes I read a petition saying, hey, she's appointing her friends, she's doing this. I'm wondering, how will they get in through Karin? Karin is the chief director. How will they get in a DPSA? Because those guys tick every box they have to, that has to be ticked, and they are very focused. And then I realized that people don't appreciate things they have at times because I think that in terms of administration, our HR is very strong at DPSA, but I want more. I want the strategic capability. I want the business partnering. I want all those things which they must still build. But from an HR administration point of view, I think that, um, yeah, um, um, uh, especially things like recruitment and et cetera, I've, I've seen um, a lot of commitment in colleagues uh, that are doing that particular work. But we need to build extra capability to take it to the next level and change the culture in relation to that. So, Karin, I ap appreciate your honest advice. Sometimes it's too honest, but, you know, uh, it's appreciated because we have to get that advice. Sometimes I'll say, let me go and sleep over it 
because I don't like what you are saying, but I have to remind myself that you are the professionals, you are the gatekeepers in relation to this area, and I must respect the professional advice. And I hope all heads of departments um, um, uh, do it like that. There is a need uh, to shift from a centrally controlled process-driven public service to a service which treats all public servants as valuable resources, focused on service delivery outcomes, assigned managerial responsibilities for results, holds public servants accountable for their actions, conducts its business professionally, transparently and eth ethically. There is an issue about rigidity of the regulatory frameworks which have not enabled service delivery but promotes malicious compliance. And we, we, we have to really create a balance. And I like the discussion yesterday because it really says create a balance. Compliance, we need compliance. And I think if you are dealing with compliance, you need the rigidity. rigidity. But how do we ensure that we don't compromise service delivery in that process? So uh, we, in, our, in our work as DPSA, as Treasury, as Department of Labor, those who are responsible for some compliance issues in Program 1 in the public service, we have to think about um, uh, this uh, thing. Um, our rhetoric, rhetoric is largely developmental in my view, but our public administration practice is very rigid and stiff. And this is something as a HOD I always, I always get caught into, that, you know, I want something to be done urgently, but there must be a submission. And the submission is useful because I can't just wake up and say this must be done without following proper processes. So that balance between rigidity and the turnaround times for these submissions and all these things is very important. So colleagues, I, that's, that's what I thought I would share for this session. I hope it makes sense and I hope you can engage with it further. And I hope you can use it as well to reflect on your own stance and your own contribution in terms of these issues that we are dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, DG. Um, I think we can all agree that your presentation was indeed frank and honest, and you shared um, some very valuable takeaways that uh, we can reflect on. Um, I think in terms of the, your introductory remarks, I made note uh, regarding your research outputs and dissemination plans for, for DPSA. I think coming from the research space, I think it's definitely something to be lauded and, and something to, be look, to look forward to. Um, also, in terms of your, you know, sharing of the poor handling of personal information, unethical behavior, and the work-life balance, I think it strikes a very um, personal note with, you know, within each of us, and it resonates. Um, and I think you you mentioned something quite useful as well. I would love to know what is the work-life balance for a man. I mean, we know what it's like for a woman or what it's not like for a woman. But yeah, maybe somewhere along the line, there'll be some research and di a discourse on that. What is work-life balance for a man? Um, but yeah, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, DG. Um, next, we have on the agenda uh, productivity in the public service. Um, on your program, it says that we will be expecting a presentation from Mr. Motiba from um, Productivity SA. However, we have a um, another representative who is Ms. Kabawutse Kabawutse uh, from uh, Productivity SA. Please welcome her onto stage. Thank you. is not linked to so I'm not going to appear in my screen. Slides work for me. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Motlatsi Khabautwe. I know we, the lady struggled a bit to pronounce my surname. Um, I'm Matlatsi Khabautu, I'm Tswana. 
Um, I'm from Productivity SA. I'm a senior researcher. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Productivity SA is, um, we are a Schedule 3A public entity um, established by a, a legislation, a piece of legislation called the Employment and Services Act. Our mandate is to promote productivity and employment. And we have two key flagships that actually carries that mandate. The first one is called uh, Business Turnaround, which is responsible for supporting initiatives aiming at preventing job losses. And the other one is called Competitiveness Improvement Services Program. Um, its role is to basically improve productivity and inculcate a culture of productivity in the workplace. And it does that by developing competencies um, within a workplace, but more importantly, um, to evaluate and facilitate uh, productivity improvement in a workplace. But today I'm here to talk about research that we have done. So I'm not here to talk about uh, productivity essays programs. Um, my role here today is to talk to you about linking individual productivity to organizational productivity. Um, the outline of my presentation will touch on the, on, on the introduction. I just want to talk about the rationale at a very high level, why we need productivity. Um, what are the measurement challenges of productivity? And what is the conceptual understanding of productivity? Because productivity in the public service is different from productivity in the private sector. And then I'm going to be just um, giving a very helicopter overview of uh, the lessons of linking productivity between in, um, individuals and organizational, and then zoom into the research that we have done uh, on productivity in the public service. And just to uh, pause a little bit on this point, um, we have worked with the Department of Public Service and Administration um, before. Uh, we had an MOU to actually develop a framework um, to measure productivity in the public service. And the idea was to pilot and, and, and try to replicate it across other sectors. Unfortunately, that couldn't happen because I think because of the change of guard, things just fell through the cracks and um, they didn't move. But nonetheless, I think I will, I will share some important lessons of linking um, individual productivity to organizational productivity. And then um, I'll, I'll also talk about the implications of linking productivity and particularly because I think we are living in a very difficult time and, and when we are faced with a crisis, there, there, there are opportunities as well to try and deal with the issues that we face and um, I'm very happy to be here to be talking about the role that productivity um, can play in trying to alleviate some of the challenges that we face as a country. And then I'm just going to um, take you through a case study that we have done, um, but it's again on, on a high level and just give you concluding remarks. You can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I think um, measuring or appraisal of government uh, performance is, is really necessary. And we need to justify the use of public resources. Um, especially in a context where fiscal resources are constrained and we're really facing tough economic uh, conditions which actually um, uh, threatens the sustainability of some of the government programs that are currently underway and even service delivery um, to, to our citizens. So what are the real major reasons why we need to be concerned about productivity in the public sector. I've just outlined three reasons. The first one, I think um, the DG has already alluded to, the size of the public service. About 1.6, sorry, 1.2 million people are employed in the public service. So we need to know the labor productivity of that. And we know about, um, it makes up 16% of the entire workforce that we have in South Africa. So it becomes very necessary to measure uh, productivity. Um, the second point is on the public service being the major of provider of services and, and goods and services. Um, when you look at the size of the public service, especially South African public service compared to international size, we amongst the, you know, the largest in, 
33% of our public expenditure makes up the GDP. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's quite a sizable um, chunk of, 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 of public finance that is spent on, on the public service. And the third one is um, we know that uh, the government is the major consumer of, of, of tax resources. So I think most of us were listening to the minister yesterday when he was presenting his budget speech and he was actually sharing how he's going to be allocating about um, 1.7 trillion um, of money towards different needs that we need as a country. So from that perspective, then it becomes very key that we understand that um, measurement of productivity is very important. Um, but productivity is a key significant factor in, um, in both public and private sector. Um, in the private sector, it's a ratio, it's a quantitative measure that looks at output over input. But when you look at the public service, you have to approach it a little bit different because the public service actually provides quality, service quality. So you have to look at the service which has a, a tangible element um, which needs to be taken into account. So we need to, to, to look at it a little bit different um, in the public service. But most importantly, um, the, the definition of productivity in the public sector, it's the capacity of the public service to respond to the needs in an economic and efficient manner. And, and I think the man on the street, when you ask him if he understands what productivity is, um, the likely response you'll get is, is that they're looking at the value of the public services um, that they receive um, in, in return for the public funding that is actually allocated. So it's that relationship that we emphasize, but more importantly is the efficiency, effectiveness, and the equity part, and I'll explain that um, uh, later. The, the measurement of productivity is not easy in the public service, and because, um, as I've already alluded to one point, that service quality is quite important. So you need to get the views of the citizen in terms of their experience of public service uh, performance. So when we talk about Batupili uh, principle as a framework that actually guides delivery of services to the public, then we need to be in return getting their experience of how they have experienced uh, public service from, from, from government. So that, that um, service quality uh, becomes another important thing. Another uh, problem with measuring productivity in the public service is that it is not uh, priced. So, for example, when you go to a shop, you know that you know any product that's on the shelf it has a price on it. But with public service, uh, most services are for free. So you have to find a way of trying to get around the problem of measuring it um, that would actually work. And then the last thing is um, we know that not all public services offer the same service, um, if you like. So if you look at the defence um, force, um, they offer sort of collective service. So they, their role is to provide us with security. But when you look at education and um, uh, and health, they provide individual service. So you need to be very mindful of how you measure productivity from those two angles because um, it won't be um, the same. Um, this side is meant to actually give an indication of how you would tell or recognize productivity improvement. And, and this is very basic. And, and, and I apologize for, for some of you who are advanced in this room and understand productivity better. But the point here is made that how would you know that productivity is improved or not? And if you look on the right slide, especially the top um, uh, a figure there, it's, it's, it's about doing more with less. So if you're able to reduce your inputs and get more outputs out of it, then all the good. And this is what we are facing as a country currently. The Minister of Finance said we are facing a fiscal constraint. How do we do more? Sorry, uh, yes. How do we do yes more with less? Um, try to reduce our inputs. And by inputs, I'm not only talking labour. There are also other inputs that can actually come into the, uh, into the picture, which includes um, infrastructure, capital, um, and, and, and other related 
aspects. Um, on the bottom, it talks about um, if you where resources remain the same, so you keep your 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 inputs the same, but your output keeps um, improving. So. All these graphs that I have, I'm not going to go through all of them. I think I'm going to share the slides and you can have the, look at them at your own time. But the, all this point that I say, uh, telling us is with productivity, you need to be innovative. You need to think out of the box and um, things cannot always be the same. So we're talking about continuous improvement with the limited resources because, you know, in economics, we know that Resources are limited and we have to try and stretch them to try and accommodate everyone. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, as I indicated in the introduction of the slide, that the main purpose why I'm here is to talk about linking individual productivity to organizational productivity. When we did um, our research study, we had to look at international best practice and try to see how we can then take the good out of it, but at the same time, try to adapt it to our own context because it's no point looking at what international, how good things are done, but we can't really bring them back home and, and suit them to the conditions that we face. So we look at the, um, the OECD countries in how they actually try to link their productivity uh, between individuals and um, the organization. And what we found is that there are quite a diverse number of approaches and they basically they categorize them into two, you know, two different types. The first one is called the aggregated and the other one is called the disaggregated one. The aggregated one, it actually looks at like very large organization. So its focus is just on input and output and none other factors actually becomes important as when you actually calculate that. So they use mathematical um, tools and statistics to try to arrive at the global figure. So it's almost, um, if I were to compare it to something close, it's like calculating inflation. So you would have a basket of good and then take that basket of good weight according to um, different weights depending on the importance of the items in the basket and then ultimately come up with a figure that you would um, use when you apply your mathematical um, uh, equations. So that is the aggregated figure. The disaggregated figure, what it does, it actually breaks down productivity into its core components. So you look at things that drive productivity. You have to look at both direct and indirect measures that affect productivity and try to um, divide those components into different segments of um, a productivity. So according to this diagram that you see here, what we have done is to then break down productivity into a few interconnected components. So you, you you have your inputs. So your inputs, I think most of us are familiar with what inputs are. So you would look at um, um, the cost of labor, you know, number of employees that are employed in an organization. If we are measuring product, labor productivity, you would have to look at the infrastructure that is, is, is provided. You would have to look at goods and services that you need to be, en to be enabled um, to carry out your function. So that's the, the, the first part. The second part is to look at your operations. Are your operations well laid out for you to actually do your work? And the first thing is to, for example, look at HR, um, HRM recruitment practices. So your performance management system becomes quite important in this regard. Financial management um, also is quite key because you have to make sure that you are cost effective in how you apply your, you apply your resources. Your IT infrastructure becomes also another important thing because it becomes an enabler um, to help you to do your work. And then you have to then carefully um, identify what your outputs are. And obviously your outputs would be related to um, the services that you are rendering. So if you are in the um, in, in, in the in, in, in the health sector, for example, you're a doctor, you would look at the, the number of consultations that you have to actually give um, as, 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 a, as a measure of output. The most important thing is 
the impact of your outputs. How is it really affecting and changing the, the people, the lives um, around you, for example? So with the number of consultation that the doctor has identified as his inputs, then he needs to actually check, does it affect the well-being of the individual that has consulted to see me um, regarding their health? Have they recovered from their illness? Is there change? And you can apply the same analogy to education. You have um, your outputs uh, as your you know, number of uh, students that, that, that go to school who are enrolled and making sure that there's access. But at the end of the day, you're looking at impact, literacy rates, numeracy. Um, are we doing well? So, so this is the diagram is trying to actually break things down in, in that fashion where you are able to identify its core component um, of your service, we call it a service delivery process because it then means you would have to use your inputs or your resources, then transform them into outputs through your, your processes, um, which is your operations management, and then ultimately get your outputs which you know you expect that would give some type of outcomes. Thank you. Next slide. We also look at the 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 UK and, and, and I think I must just do a disclaimer. Most of these countries are European because um, they are quite advanced in terms of measurement of productivity in the public sector. When you look at most of our African countries, they come and they look to us to help them. Um, so when we were doing research, we actually really struggled to find a, a comprehensive framework that was um, complete in terms of explaining how productivity in the public sector is measured. So with the UK, it's the same setup where they have this disaggregated method that is broken down into different parts of the service delivery process. And But the, mo the, the distinguishing factor from the the, the OCD model is that they use principles to, to actually um, support the results of productivity. So they use what they call triangulation to say you need more information to actually explain the results of, the, of, 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 your, of your productivity measurement. So in other words, productivity as an indicator alone cannot be used to actually explain the performance of the economy you need to support it with other factors which are independently corroborated um, for you to, to actually, because at, at the end of the day, the result will give you something, but when you look down at the numbers you got, you need to actually find supporting evidence to back up um, the ultimate result that you get. Next slide. The interesting one that we found was the Australian one. Um, their focus is a framework of three variables. So they look at efficiency, effectiveness, and, um, uh, and equity. So what they first look at on equity is about access. So they, they look at whether the needs of special groups are actually addressed through the outputs that are provided. So when you look at this diagram, the first thing is equity. So access becomes um, important because it's about participation in the, in the system and making sure that those that are marginally excluded are actually part of the process. So that's, that's one thing. And then they look at effectiveness and effectiveness, they break it down into three components. So it must actually include um, access, appropriate and uh, quality. So on the appropriate, it's, it's, it's about your outputs being able to achieve your objectives. So whatever that you do, and you said right at the beginning, you need to go back to your objectives and see, are my outputs addressing the, out, uh, the objectives that I have actually set? And then the last one, which is quite important, is its efficiency. It's, you know, the, what is the cost of delivering the service? Um, when you, again, I'm just gonna make an example to make it clear, uh, when you look at education, for, 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 for example, you would look at the, the amount of money that government is spending on education. Are we getting the kind of outcomes that we expect to see? That's an important question. 
what is happening in the middle that is stopping us from really translating that input, the amount of money that is spent into education to ultimately result, um, you know, give us a result that is, 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 is expected on, on, on education. So the, the outcomes, the learning outcomes that we get from the education sector relative to the money that is spent. And, and I think most of you in the room know that South Africa compares very favorable with other developing countries on spending on education. We are one of the, hard, the highest, we are lauded as the best in, in, in the world. But when you look at our outcomes, they're very poor. So what, what is wrong in the middle? What, why are we seeing that disjuncture? Next slide. I don't know why it actually turned black, but I just um, hope I'll, Alex, I'll be able to, to remember what's going on there. And then we looked at the Swedish model, Sweden. Sweden, it's, it's, it's a welfare state. You know, they spend about almost 60% of, the, of their GDP on welfare benefits. Most Scandinavian countries are welfare -ish. They, they have a lot of people on, their, on, a, on a grant system, but they are a working economy. So again, I think it, it, it almost, there's just some similarities when you look at their, the, you know, their, their public sector system compared to us, but more importantly, when we look at how they measure productivity um, in, in, in their space. And what they do here, um, in terms of linking productivity uh, at individual and organizational level. They identify, as, as I've already said, the core factors on productivity. So those ones that I've already showed you, input, output, processes, and then the outcome. And then they would actually weigh, the same, it's, it's the same thing that you would do when you are doing your scorecard or your performance management. So you weigh your core factors according to their perceived importance to your performance. But in this case, we are saying perceived importance to productivity. Then the next thing, you then deconstruct those core factors into individual indicators that are also weighted. And then you come up with a scoring criteria from one to four. And obviously one being the lowest performance, four being the highest productivity. And then you do your calculations, and at the end of the day, you come with a figure that gives you how you have performed. So it's a similar analogy that is actually applied in the Scandinavian model. And this is the best model that we thought um, could apply for South Africa. And the research study that we undertook, I think it was in 2018, um, at the Department of Education in, in, in Limpopo, actually tried to use this model to measure productivity. I'm running out of time, I have to be quick. Um, can you move to the next slide, thank you. So this is, after looking at international level experience and understanding how they link productivity at individual and organizational level, we came up with this framework. We worked together, as I said, with, um, I don't know if some of you might be familiar with Mr. Ismail David. I think he's a director in one of the departments at DPSA. So we worked with him in coming together, coming up together with this uh, model. Again, it's just the service delivery production process, which just tells you that productivity is about inputs, outputs, processes, and outcome. Thank you. Next. Um, so this is, this, this is my field now, research, where I come from, and this is what we did. Um, we took that framework and tried to apply it in the education sector, looking at the Limpopo Department of Education as a, you know, as a pilot site. And the idea was to replicate it to other sectors of government and again, we chose education, obviously, because it is um, one of the highest components of government uh, public expenditure. So it then made sense to choose this thing. The objective, as I said, was to pilot the study and um, to look at whether it can be practical at, 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 a, at an, a sector level, 
as a, as, as a start. And as I indicated, the scope, it was at the Department of um, Education in the Limpopo government. And we, methodology and framework, we used we consultation. We spoke to the personnel and the officials of the Limpopo government. We also asked them for documentation to look at the performance management systems, the financial systems, the um, profiles, you know, all the information that could actually help us. And we looked at internationally what are some of the factors that we need for, for comparison. Like in this instance, when you look at learning outcomes, for example, you'll see in my framework at the end, in, in the education space, when we compare, for example, um, with the international comparison rankings internationally, um, we look at the, the um, a consortium called SACMEC. It's an Eastern and African uh, consortium that merges literacy and maths um, in the African region. So they compare us to uh, to, to other African, Eastern, and, 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 and North African country. And I must say, it, it is very, it's a very depressing picture when, 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 when you look at the result. Um, next slide. So what we did here, we identified the core factors with, as I said, we consulted with the Limpopo government. So with the officials, it was almost like a, a workshop. What, what makes up your inputs? What makes up your outputs? What processes do you need to put in place to ensure that you are able to convert your outputs, sorry, your inputs into outputs? And what is the significance of, your, of the output in terms of achievement of your, you know, your performance? Because in most cases you find people say, look, I, I couldn't do my work or I couldn't achieve during the performance review. I couldn't achieve certain things because I was not well equipped to do so. So you first need to make sure that all the resources are in place to support the work that is um, at hand. We also had to agree on what kind of outputs do you need um, to, do, to, do, to actually agree that um, this correctly measures your performance and they indicated you know, um, learner attendance becomes another an important indicator, and um, uh, and, and retention rates because we know in the system that um, there's a leakage. So, a child that starts primary um, grade R, they some of them ultimately get lost in the system and they never get to reach metric. So we need to to actually get a sense of you know, what could be the reason and how do we actually get around that? And what is government doing to try and dealing with that type of problem? Because we, you know, we need to be making sure that our labor force is equipped to take our economy forward. Next slide. So after the interviews, the discussions, the review of documentation that was provided to us. We did the number crunching behind the scenes um, to understand what would be the results of productivity for this particular um, government department. And what we found was average productivity. So there was indeed, um, it was quite concerning. So again, the point I raised with so much public spending in the economy, why our outcomes are suffering. And this was a typical example in this situation where our outcomes were not matching our inputs. Um, I'm just, um, I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna move on to the, the other slide, I think, um, which is, I think this one is quite important. I think if, if, if we need to link productivity at individual and, and organizational level, we need to define the the service production process. Um, at the end. So at the level where I'm a research, I'll just make a quick example of myself, where when I get employed, the first thing that I ask for is, do I have the modeling systems that would help me to do empirical work, you know, to, to do my research? So uh, am I supported by the organization to do my work? That's the first thing. So I will say these are my inputs and then in terms of processes i will make sure that do i have um 
IT support? Um, do am I getting support from my HR when I need help? Um, if in terms of additional resources, then I would have to look at what my outputs are. My outputs are published reports. I need to publish my reports at the end of the day. But it does. It shouldn't end there. Where once I've published them, they gather dust and nothing really happens. I have to make sure that this research output that I make is going to influence, you know, for example, policy decisions. It has to change the way our organization is performing. So it has to be something that is impactful at the end of the day that results into um, a meaningful outcome that when you edit at the you know when you edit it becomes something very clear so that's the thing so the service delivery process becomes very important and we need to understand what are we really measuring as i indicated in the first slide of my presentation we are looking at labor productivity um, labor forms part of a big part of the input side of productivity. How much are you getting? So in, in where I work in productivity essay, they would ask you, are you do you have uh, income revenue generation projects that you have lined up? Because we believe that what we are paying you needs to be augmented by additional work. So you need to make sure that you, 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 you bring in additional money for the organization. So that's how it works. So you have to understand that labor productivity becomes the core um, of measurement. And then there has to be regular collection of data and information. So once we agree that we are going to be tracking a particular indicator, we have to consistently monitor it and make sure that it, it we, we, we measure it and, and um, compare it to, for example, if you had the baseline. So there has to be improvement. And there, it has to be validated. So um, once you have done your, your, your calculations, or you've done your performance reviews, and then you submit your, your, the outcome of your results, um, I know there's a moderation committee that sits to actually look at the scoring that you've received. It's a similar um, analogy that you would actually also use here. You need an independent verification process that would make sure that indeed productivity has actually improved according to the findings that have been found. And then the implications here then of linking productivity at an individual and organizational level comes in when we talk about um, linking short-term performance bonus to productivity. So essentially what we're saying is our performance management system, especially the bonus part, should be looking at the variable component that gives incentives to productivity. There will be a fixed variable, for example, that tracks the cost of living and that we cannot really uh, meddle with it. But productivity then has to be linked to um, there's variable components, and, and, and in most cases in the government space, it is the incentive budget that is on the site and that is available for, for additional spending on, on, on salary increases. Next slide. I think I will skip um, this slide, but the point here is that we have conducted a study, um, as I indicated, okay, we, we I mentioned um, a program at Productivity SA called um, CIS, which is Competitiveness Improvement Program. What they do is to inculcate the culture of productivity in workplaces. So we have a methodology that we use to actually assist companies um, to implement um, world best practice. Um, we use Japanese method, Kaizen. So we have a, a relationship with the Japanese um, um, a productivity agency in working towards assisting most of our workplaces um, on productivity. So we have done projects with rainwater. Um, we have done with the UIF, um, just to mention um, a few. Okay. okay, last slide. Okay, this is uh, my concluding slide. Um, I think if we are really serious about productivity in the public service, um, there has to be a pronouncement on it 
especially from political will side, there has to be commitment. South Africa needs to set itself a challenge of managing and measuring productivity in the public sector, especially in the constant way, in the context where we have fiscal constraint and the economic environment is, is really tough. And how do we do more? Well, how do we do more with little? So it becomes very important that um, as a country we set that, um, uh, that objective. And here is a proposal. The second uh, point is that we need to work with. I know there's a there's a school of governance which provides training on, you know, public sector related courses. And I thought that we need to work with them from a productivity essay side and see how we can, as a start, try to teach productivity. Um, concepts and methods and, and how they can actually be applied at any workplace before we begin to measure it um, in the public sector. So there needs to be a consciousness and awareness about what productivity is and how do you measure it and how do you see it before you can start implementing it at the, at the workplace level. And then um, we also call upon, you know, the institutions of, of higher learning to work with us um, in terms of looking at benchmarking other countries that are in this space as well, so that we can, as I, we can then validate some of the work that we do, and we can collaborate, you know, to to try and make sure that uh, productivity is embraced throughout. And then, um, lastly, we think that. Um, DPSA can also sponsor quite a number of studies on how to measure productivity in, in public service. And particularly given that um, we did a study, a pilot project, but somehow it fell through the cracks and we never got to replicate it. And it was good work that went behind that work. So it then becomes important that we try to reestablish this connection and forge forward you know, a way that can make us collaborate and make productivity in the public sector to become a reality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Productivity SA. Um, that was a very insightful um, presentation, uh, which I'm sure will be available to to all of you here, should you wish to engage further, because unfortunately we had to um, conclude um, rather sharply. Um, colleagues, we have um, the need, the need has just arisen to to revise the program in front of you. Uh, we have, I, well, two more presentations um, for this session, uh, for this uh, session uh, of part B in our in our program today. And that is from uh, Vitz Real, as well as from DPSA and DPME, a joint presentation. However, I would like to appeal to the presenters, um, given that it is now, um, 10 to 1 and we're supposed to be breaking for for lunch at 1. I think if we can break for lunch at quarter past 1 and be back at quarter to 2 so we can somewhat try to stick to the program so we're on track for the um, breakaway sessions and the plenary report back thereafter. So um, I'd like our next two presenters to please keep in mind if we could just limit the, the presentations to at least 10 to 12 minutes each. Um, so up next, we have strengthening the state capacity, a review of skills, uh, demand and supply in the public sector. This is from Mr. Shabalala and Prof. Anne McLennan um, from, Peace, uh, from the uh, Fitzreal um, Center. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you just, do you press the green button if you want? To? Thank you. Um, you've all been uh, sitting for a very long time. And if you look on the slide there, you'll see I'm not Anne McLaren, actually. I'm Anne McLennan. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and together as a team, we, uh, we represent the elders and the youth. So um, I think that's quite good. There's a missing middle which worries me, actually, um, in just about every sector that does public services. 
Um, what I want to do is, because you have been sitting for a long time, and I saw lots of nodding heads um, in the last session, is I want you to wriggle and let out a roar quickly so that you will pay attention, especially if I have to speed talk. So do that. One, two, three, go. Ah! <laughs> I hope you're awake now. Okay, we, we, we did this research as part of a much uh, larger uh, program to support um, PCTA in some of the work they're doing. So the primary focus is on skill supply and demand in, in, in South Africa. And I'm going to very briefly um, do an introduction um, and hopefully uh, Temba is going to even more briefly summarize the findings and, um, and, and then I'm going to, in the spirit of being a, a, a transformative academic, I'm going to suggest some ways about thinking about strategy going forward. Um, so the broader context of this research, and I, I, I listened in yesterday online around the, um, the, the compliance and uh, the Office for Compliance and Regulation, is this idea of a professional public service that's developmental and ethical and that delivers services. And so the big problem that we're thinking about is um, how do we build skills and what skills do we need for a professional, developmental, ethical public service? And, and one of the challenges is, and I think both the DG and the minister referred to this, is, that, is, is how we understand capacity in particular and, and how that relates to capability and being a capable state. Capacity actually is, is, is the, the kind of idea of something that's there already. So for example, we've got 1.2 million public servants. That's capacity. Whether they're actually able to do their work in an efficient and effective way, we don't know yet or maybe they have to develop. But if we look at the outcomes that are facing us, including um, stage six, <laughs> um, we, we can assume that although there's the capacity there, we still have to develop the capability for people to be able to do their jobs effectively. And that requires a whole series and complex issues um, which, which need to be defined and many of which have been referred to. And the reason I'm focusing on this, and because it relates to professionalism as well, is both capability and professionalism are linked to the idea that people can act autonomously without being, having a whip over them. In other words, they self-regulate, they're committed, they're responsible, they do what they're supposed to do. And in order to build that kind of capability, people do need the skills, which is the training, um, they, they, they also need motivation and agency, so they actually have got to want to do the work and then they need to work in a space that allows them to do the work that they're supposed to do. So if, if it takes six weeks to get a, a submission approved, you can't do the work you have to do because you have to sit around for six weeks while that submission works its way up or down depending on, on uh, where, where you are in the system. So it's with that framework in mind that the research was done. I'm going to skip over this one because you can read about it. So the way we did this research looking at skills for a developmental state was um, we said, what's the goal? What are we aiming for? What's actually there in place? How does it work? And then got to the strategy. So very quickly, the goal, um, the goal is to, to build a capable public service. And this is in the um, 
It's in the RDP, for any of you who are old enough to remember the RDP. I'm trying to see. Um, oh, and that's another good thing. If the average age of public servants is over 55, use bigger writing on your slides. Okay, even with glasses, we need bigger writing. Um, so is the, um, is, is, is the, yeah, so how do we create the RDP, the NDP, the Constitution, uh, professional public servants, the, the um, president in his State of the Nation address, they all talk about this need. But what, what does it mean actually to have a capable state and what's the context that we operate in? And, and the kind of key contextual issues that we have to work within are policy and systems, in other words, politics. And we've already heard that there's a lot of challenge with politics in terms of the public service sector, and that works in, in, in two ways. One is that very often public services work up towards the minister, because that's how the structure works, and that's what's encouraged. And not all DGs can say, with respect, minister, you can't do that. Um, but it's also that the system itself is politicized. And that's in part because we inherited a system from, um, from apartheid um, that hasn't really changed. The basic public admin process hasn't really changed. Um, so socioeconomic conditions, as we know, so I won't go into that. And then work organization and culture. And here, one of the big issues, and this is also part of, of, of a heritage issue, but I think it's, um, it's, it's got more complex, is, is the heritage issue is that it was a very hierarchical, rank-based public service. Um, now it's a very compliant, compliant culture-run public service. But it's not the kind of compliance that comes with autonomy. It's a tick box compliance. And, and, and what that does actually, that kind of compliance, that kind of very closely monitored compliance that's, you know, where people tick it off, is people work to rule. They say, here are the things I have to do. This is what my contract says. And also because, as many of you have noticed, we're not always checking the outcomes, the implications of that compliance. Um, they tick it off and, and then it's done. But what that does is erode professional um, judgment and accountability. And a good example of this is for teachers with the curriculum framework. So teachers will often, they're told that they have to finish this much of the curriculum in this time. And so they do it, even if they know from their professional knowledge that actually the children haven't learned what they're supposed to learn in that time. And they do it because someone's going to check up on them and if they don't do it by then, they're going to be in trouble. And so... And so they, they, that problem of children not being able to read and write, in fact, the latest statistics show that our, our grade four reading for understanding um, rate has declined. Um, so, so it, and this is because people are working to rule and not exercising their professional judgment. And if a public service has to be ethical, then it needs to be able to do that. And then just, I'm going to, yeah, I don't even know if I should go here, but just to say that, that the shape of the state has changed over time as well. And I won't go into detail, but what it means is not that the policy state, which is the kind of immediate, we're going to change all the policy, um, you know, do the anti-apartheid thing, redistribute, the policy state doesn't disappear, it continues. And as you can hear here, lots of you are saying, oh, we'll just develop a policy for that, we'll regulate for this, we'll put in the appliance, uh, compliance thing. I was listening on the budget review, we just need to sort out management, then we'll fix, out, fix things. Um, and, and so we have different kind of, I suppose, strategic focuses or political focuses for, for the state. 
and 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 sort of we're now talking about a developmental state but we still have the policy state and the implementing state at play and what happens is we kind of layer on these different approaches and that has implications for how we understand both skills anticipation and skills provisioning Oh, can ignore those. Ah, okay. So, so sorry, I don't even know how long I've been. No. Shit. Okay, they say no minutes left. Sorry. I hope you can delete that. No. Apologies to anyone who has to listen to my foul mouth. So, so the, the key issue here, and I, I think this is an important point, and then hopefully we need a few more minutes. I'm sorry, but you can't tell us at the end that we don't have half an hour. Um, is how do you decide what the skills for a developmental ethical state are, a capable developmental and ethical state are. And um, I, I think that's really important because how we measure skills at the moment is we have a list and people do skills audits and then they say, the minister read the list there, we need policy analysts and managers and this and that and all the rest of it. But actually what might the skills be um, that people need if, if, if they, um, if, if, if they are, um, if they're going to work in, 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 as in a complex um, changing society and public service, and particularly one that's professional. And so there needs to be a space where we can look at what new skills emerge. So maybe understanding your context and conditions and how they change, how to build collaborative relationships, because we still work in silos and don't talk to each other enough, how to influence and build trust. Those might be the kinds of skills you need for a developmental and ethical state, and not necessarily, um, yeah, policy management, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay, um, afternoon everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, can I please have the... Oh, sorry. The green button. Okay. But you don't. <laughs> okay. They're appearing. Okay, so in the last slide that Anne ended on, we were going to consider some of the factors that shape public service sector skills demand and supply by having a meander through the south african skills system in general and then moving on further into the south african public service system and how it's structured now we're not going to do that in the interests of time but we're going to spend a bit of time on this particular slide because if we don't do that then everything that I'm going to say after this will not make sense to you. So let's start with the South African public service, uh, the South African public service sector skill system. It's quite a very complex system. And if you can look um, in your screens, we basically have three planning systems that are led by three planning actors. We've got the DPSA, we've got the DPME, and we've got the DHET on the skills supply side of the equation with, of course, the public service sector uh, education authority as the skills authority in the public uh, service sector. So the minister defines the terms and conditions of employment, the competencies, and all the mandatory training that is needed for all officials. And then under the Public Service Act, and then this is then operationalized through various frameworks. Um, then the provincial departments, the offices of the premier and the national departments all then have to report to the DPSA. 
Now, the second system that shapes demand planning is the DPME. And uh, it's responsible for national planning, performance, and evaluation. And national departments, for example, also need to report to it along with the DPSA. And then, of course, the third planning system on the supply side is the DHET, which is responsible for post-school education and training. And this includes higher education institutions, colleges, CETAs, etc. There are also additional stakeholders, such as the PSC, the PSCBC. Now, if you can look at the slide, the three planning sectors are ringed, are the ones that are ringed in orange. Departments need to plan and report on skills in triplicate. Using the same data, they need to report to the DPSA, to the DPME, and to the PCTA. And the providers are the ones that are circled in blue. This includes all the national academies, TVET colleges, etc. Now, what becomes critical for our analysis is that in theory, these three systems are supposed to operate as part of an integrated whole. In other words, the TPME's mandate, which is supposed to filter down into the DPSA, thus influencing provincial and national departments, while on the supply side, the data that is collected by the PCTA must inform the mandate of the DHEAD, which must formulate policies in line with those dynamics, which then should shape the contours that inform the actions of the demand side via the DPME and the DPSA. Now, when we began our data collection, we went into the field expecting a harmonious, symbiotic relationship between these three supply and demand actors. But the responses that we got over and above the desktop research that we did suggested a different reality. Okay, so now, what did we learn from the research and what possible strategy that th does this learning lead us to suggest to the PCTA about the implications of our findings for the current state of future skills demand and supply in the public service sector? Now, by virtue of the complexity of demand and supply planning systems, we identified two broad themes which we believe encapsulate the central problematic in terms of skills demand and supply within the public service sector. We call these the multiplication of planning systems and the proliferation of training. The multiplication of planning systems manifests itself through various sub-phenomena, which we have captured as, if you can read on the slide, the dominance of employer aggregated data, ethics and professionalism as a skills gap. When we've talked about the whole morning, compliance, as opposed to analysis as the driver of skills planning, etc. In terms of the proliferation of training, this mega phenomena manifests itself through various sub phenomena. For example, curricula not always being aligned to planning priorities, the dominance of short term training, education and training seen as the solution to broader challenges and disjunctures in planning, and various funding dynamics. Now, Let's look at a few examples of each of these mega phenomena. And from each of them, I'll only select two or three, let me see my time, two, or two examples from each of the mega themes of what our participants have told us about these factors. Now, before we move on, let's first have a few definitions. By the multiplication of planning, we are basically speaking about when government departments have to report for skills planning to three systems that work concurrently without any seeming node of coordination to streamline the data that comes out of these processes. So the DPMA through the MTSF and the MTM and MTF requires all government institutions to align their strategic plans and all performance plans and all operational plans with its mandate. Uh, sorry, the DPME, sorry. And then the DPSA, through the revised public service HRT strategic framework, also requires the development of three MTF HR plans, developing APPs, which should then inform PDPs. And then the PCTA requires WSPs as part of the data that will shape sector skills planning. And all of these processes happen simultaneously. And then when we talk about the proliferation of training, pardon me, what we are referring to is a situation where public service training is spread across a range of providers, and there seems to be no policy 
for setting the norms and standards and ensuring consistent and targeted quality within the public service when it comes to the supply of skills. From our analysis and from the responses that we've gotten, most providers offer standard programs with no indirect links to career paths and little effective focus on the formation of norms and values that create a common ethos and a sense of purpose within the public service. Curriculum quality varies across providers, methodologies vary, assessment strategies and materials vary across providers. And training is often of doubtful relevance in terms of how it will lead to delivery systems that work and in terms of skills that will shift the established patterns that we've spoken about today. So these are the two mega themes. Now let's look at some examples of the sub themes. Let's start with one theme from the multiplication of planning, which is the dominance of employer aggregated data. Now, skills identification tools focus on aggregating employer specified data and analyzing labor force surveys, which give snapshots or limited insight into the current state of emerging needs and trends over time. Now, we argue that these tools are limited in developing a picture of how the requirements of work change. Because by the time a skill need is identified and it goes through the process and it appears in a sector skills plan, the world of work might have changed. Skills planning occurs in multiple systems through a variety of stakeholders. And because there's no coordination that creates a situation where departments, this creates a situation rather, where departments are responding to three different calls for the same kind of data. And then departments then have to develop internal work processes to keep in line with that. Let's look at another example, something we've spoken about the whole morning. We argue that compliance in skills supply and demand in the public service drives these processes instead of analysis. What do we mean? The systems that are supposed to help public servants to be accountable force public servants to focus on correct reporting methods instead of actual service. Now this reporting leads to compliance being the priority, leaving less time and resources for service work. Now, if planning and reporting is coordinated through a single system, as Anne will suggest, the focus on compliance, we argue, may be reduced and it may be simpler to track actual service. Now, let's look at one quotation from a high-ranking official from the policy departments that we spoke to. We spoke to three policy departments which appear in the previous slide and we spoke to four provincial academies. He argues, I think maybe the main challenge would be that the WSP, that departments submit to the PCTA. In most instances, this is done for compliance purposes mainly, so that data actually captured in the WSP is not necessarily credible data. This is a public servant. Okay. There's also an emphasis on monitoring, not evaluation. Another ramification of the multiplication of planning is that the focus on reporting shifts the priority both from policy and service departments to placing primacy on monitoring at the expense of ev evaluation. So this dynamic feeds into the compliance culture, but from the opposite direction. So while public servants focus on complying with reporting processes at the expense of delivery, those they report to, the three systems that I outlined, they seem to focus on monitoring these reporting processes. And in our data, there was nothing that seemed to indicate how these policies and strategies and plans are then evaluated. We argue that this is a contributing factor to a state that has excellent policy, but that needs a lot of work in terms of implementing and evaluating it. Listen to one official from one of the policy departments. He says, the monitoring is probably stronger where we have a learning program. We probably aren't as strong with evaluation. It's kind, of a, it's kind of lost between the research part and the evaluation at the organizational level. And what I mean by that is we might do individual studies looking at a particular program that's been implemented, but we've not strengthened ourselves as an organization in terms of overall evaluation at an organizational level. Let me go to a few examples on the prolif proliferation of training 
and then I'm going to take my seat. Now, education and training, because of the proliferation of training, is seen as the silver bullet, the panacea, the all-encompassing solution that will solve the problems of the public service. The responses that we see in our data suggest that education and training is seen as an all-encompassing solution that will, that will eradicate the challenges that are faced by the public sector. While education and training are important in any structure, we argue that it must not be seen as a factor that can operate unilaterally or an element that will transform the current public service into an ethical and capable one. The fact that our respondents keep seeing the problems within the public service as rooted in issues of skill supply and demand seems to be one of the major factors that drive the proliferation of training. What does this mean? If skills are a problem, then in order to solve the problems in the public service, then we need to pump in more qualifications, rope in more providers, whereas there are other issues at play, structural issues, which then lead to the situation that the public service is facing. So we argue that over and above the skills question, there are other factors that we need to take into consideration, which the professionalization framework also brings to the fore. Now, finally, let me sit down. I won't do the last one. There's also the dominance of short-term training. Another way that the proliferation of training manifests itself in the public service is that skills intervention are not just profuse and complex. They are often seen to be focusing on short-term skills needs or immediate needs rather than building for the mid-term and skills that will be pertinent for the future of the public service. This exacerbates the time lag that we identified since what a skill intervention may be responding to today may have evolved and had further developments which make solving this issue even more difficult. And this occurs in a context where it's not clear how current training interventions are evaluated and updated and tailored to fit the public service. Let's look at one example from one of the provincial academies that we spoke to. He says, we work with quite a number of stakeholders. As I said, national departments, National School of Government, and recently we have identified that for senior managers, short impactful courses are more beneficial than week long courses or a month or so. A partner will offer us three short courses, I mean three hour short courses on change management, a three hour short course on any other uh, program, and they are now offering 40 short courses. So we argue that these are some of the dynamics. Now, colleagues, with, um, with um, having outlined these challenges, and in order to avoid the criticism that we academics have a fetish for problems and a phobia for solutions, I'm going to hand back to Anne, who will then present a strategy that we can use going forward. Okay, where's the? I don't even know where I am actually. Okay, I, 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 I they, they don't want to let me actually speak. So, what you've got here, very briefly, is a diagram about um, the work of, of, of. Of, of the PCTA, because we were doing this for the PCTA, and given those two things, the proliferation of training and the, um, uh, the multiplication of planning systems, one of the things we suggested that the PCTA could do is operate as a, a kind of convener, bring people together so that we can begin to learn from all these different systems. Um, and and the, the input being skills, the market inputs new people, and what you get is a consistent supply of relevant skills into a receptive, capable state. You've got your context underneath, which we spoke about, um, and then 
and and then the kind of three key areas also that that we spoke about so labor market intelligence committed value driven and accountable public service and um, and structures and systems because i think this is a very important thing and and the um the the, the minister of finance said this yesterday well we'll fix we'll fix the municipalities by building capacity which I'm sure means training, but you're going to put them back into the same dysfunctional department systems and cultures that they, that won't allow their new training to be exercised, actually. And that's the big thing, because by far, if you're looking at improving work process, the environment within which people work, the, the space is much more important. And um, so all of this shows that basically we can't change issues around development very much. They, because uh, um, economic development is hard, as we know, to make it happen. And we want to be ideally in the capable and developmental state. But what we can work on is that green pathway. So, but we can only do that if we think about capability as comprising not only training, but also working on organizational cultures that support people, um, and most importantly, the values and ethos to serve. I can't tell you how terrible I feel. This is not the easiest job in the world. Uh, cutting out, uh, you know, the value of research is, is terrible. I've read the report, so it'll actually stand you in good stead to get the uh, presentation and go through it. But standing between you and lunch is Mr. Nikum Mabunda and Mr. Jonathan Tim. That is their presentation up next. And they are going to be speaking to you about the HR implications from the findings of the commission into the state capture uh, report. And they have 10 minutes. And I will pop back to let you know about the arrangements for lunch. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tim is joining um, on online virtually. Is he available? Yes. Is he available? Uh, Mr. Tim, we're waiting for you. We can hear you, or we'd like to hear you. Speaking. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, yes, well, greetings. thank you. Uh, gre greetings to everybody. Um, uh, I think the, um, yeah, it's 10 minutes. We, I will uh, try and just spend then uh, five minutes. Uh, Nico is going to take half of this. So if I can uh, request that the slide is moved to the first slide, uh, we're going to be talking about the um, implications from the State Capture Commission, and we will just very briefly uh, uh, touch on some uh, high level points. I think, so what were the findings of the uh, Commission's um, work? And if I can, um, so can we, is, is, it, is it visible? Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to organize myself from this side. Okay, so it, it, yeah, so I'm going I'm talking to a slide titled "Findings of the State Capture Commission," and so the commission ultimately found that state capture did take place in South Africa on an extensive scale, and this was facilitated by a deliberate efforts to exploit or weaken key state institutions and public entities, um, as well as law enforcement, and that. To, the large, to a large extent, this occurred through strategic appointments and dismissals uh, uh, in, in, the, in the public service. Um, so if we can go to the next um, uh, slide, I won't go through all the points here, but obviously a part of state capture involved the manipulation of the public narrative and also subversion of, of, um, of democratic processes. I want to 
uh, I think this quote, I think, is quite important. It's by uh, a, a researcher, Ryan Brunet, um, and it, it, it talks about, I think it's a very useful observation that, that um, you know, basically the, the mechanism, essential mechanism, if an external body, be it a party structure or an informal cabal or an, an interest group, control a politician, then they control the appointments within the politician's authority. And so they, the essential mechanism of state capture allows that these decisions, uh, controls these decisions and puts them under the, uh, under the control of, un, of undemocratically constituted and opaque fora. Um, so resources are, are, are extracted with this mechanism in part to purchase by patronage the mass political support to perpetuate uh, this capture. And so this observation is key, I think. The method of politicization that was originally intended to assert control over a potentially resistant apartheid public administration and to redirect state the state towards progressive purposes produces its antithesis which is an administration that evades democratic control. So I think that is quite a, for me, an important observation of how unintended consequences of the current formulation of political power uh, uh, and influence have, 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 have produced uh, uh, an undesirable state. Uh, we'll just move now. So we, had, we extracted from the commission's work um, various testimonies that talk to the personal stories of uh, uh, employees of the state uh, who who came up against the state capture pr program. The first is the well-known um, uh, former head of GCIS who faced uh, uh, really difficult circumstances when he resisted the um, uh, attempts to capture the GCIS advertising budget and was dis was, was was removed from his position. I think just go through these quite rapidly. Then the second. Um, is the uh, also the former head of uh, GCIS uh, who faced uh, harassment from the minister uh, and and, uh, uh, and and ultimately um, was was uh, repositioned um, and and spoke uh, about the personal cost of this uh, experience. Let's go to the next slide, and then I think. Um, uh, Mr. Johan van Lochenberg, who was. Uh, uh, really uh, uh, subjected to a, quite a vicious um, propaganda campaign to discredit the work uh, he was involved with at SARS, um, looking at um, politically connected uh, individuals and illicit flows of funds, um, losing his, his, his job. Uh, and then if we continue now, we move to Ambassador Kowani, who was famously... Uh, uh, Took the fall, took the took 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 the fall for the Vatakluf landing by the Gupta wedding party, and um, I think if we uh, you know look at the uh, details on this slide of the findings of the commission, um, you know notwithstanding the um, ambassador's insistence that he acted purely on his own and that had been guilty of name dropping in order to secure uh, 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 the permission, he indicated that he had not uh, actually been uh, pressurized by the president or, or, or ministers, but the, the commission found otherwise and, and um, uh, found that it was probable that he did act on the instruction of, his, uh, of the political principles when he facilitated it, notwithstanding the denial. Um, uh, so, and then I think the last one is the last case that I, we want to just put forward here is um, that of uh, former Premier Professor Job Mahoro. And here yeah, I think this shows us the, the kind of difficult situation that uh, an accounting officer uh, can face. Um, so the, the, the professor was called when he was, was then uh, Premier to, to testify. He was testifying about uh, uh, an approval of 50 million rand payment 
uh, under the then uh, Premier Mahuma Pelo. So he was an acting director general at that stage in 2014-15. He had been a director general in the province for the first administration, so certainly a very experienced administrator. And his testimony, those of you that saw it, will remember that it was quite a, it was quite an uh, difficult uh, uh, um, thing to witness. So, and the commission found that you know the <coughs> Professor Mohoro's evidence was entirely unsatisfactory, um, and that he, notwithstanding that he both knew and had accepted obligations under the PFMA. He was unable to provide any credible explanation for the fact that he authorized a payment of 50 million in respect of a contractual obligation that did not yet exist for an airline subsidy to a state-owned enterprise for which there was no budget in the relevant department. And then the, you know, the commission found that Mohoro, uh, Professor Mohoro's conduct in this regard was completely unacceptable and he should not have authorized the payment. So raising the question why, and I think when one uh, goes to the transcript and looks at the detail. Here, this slide just presents the the details in 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 its uh, you know in its excruciating detail. Um, so the the advocate asking uh, you know why um, why process a payment uh, with the with the request coming on the sixteenth of the month with an invoice dated on the twenty fourth. Um, uh, of the month subsequent to the payment. Um, and then the professor responds by saying he did not authorize it, he processed it. And then the chairperson steps in to say, I'm sorry, you said you did not authorize that you processed it. Is that the payment? And the professor says, yes, chair, because the decision had already been taken. There had been discussions, presentations that preceded this. Um, and the, the, the chairperson then tries to interrogate this around the, the processing and the, the question of authorizing when these powers lay with um, the, 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 the accounting officer. And he then talks about this tricky question. And, and, and an earlier piece of testimony gives further insight. The professor, he says, the point I keep emphasizing, and I hate to refer, refer to myself, you know, as a postman, not to say a post boy. There is a decision that is taken by the decision makers. So I think this just illustrates the challenge of having power, uh, 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 in, uh, but not actual power uh, in a de facto power. So this slide, before I hand over to, to Nico, just um, pulls out some of the the, the, the very um, visceral challenges that accounting officers and senior officials face when they're confronted um, or, you know, by, by political power that is, that is uh, uh, used for private gain. And so some of these uh, officials acted with integrity and resisted and paid a heavy price and others went along with what were illegal actions and also su suffered reputational harm and damage so some of the considerations I think need to be uh, borne in mind is, you know, what are the incentives for compliance um, versus incentives for accountability and ethics? Similarly, what are the institutional cultures playing out in support of individuals making ethical choices or not? And then this idea of what, what I call nominal power as, 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 as in legislation and prescripts, but how does that intersect with real power, which is often not always visible? And then just a, 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 a last point is that the commission created this alternative locus of, of power, of authority that shifted the balance of power. So the, the, the importance of alternative loci of power in, in, in trying to address this big question of how do you protect the state from unethical or corrupt leadership and whether you can. Um, I'll hand over to, to Nico now to, to, to continue. Um, afternoon. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I, I think what I'm going to do, because Jonathan took uh, two extra minutes, I think, from the 10 minutes that were given. <laughs> so I'll just highlight uh, very few slides, uh, not more than three minutes. Um, the, the first one is on the list of things that we are supposed to do as um, HR officials or rather as public servants. And they speak to all the areas that uh, all the speakers have been speaking to today. 
The first one is that we need to improve the checking of um, uh, disciplinary cases so that people don't run from one area to another. The next one is the, is, is, is the finalization of the legislative amendments so that we have alignment between the uh, objectives of the professionalization framework and the recommendations or the, the response by the president to the, to the recommendations of the Zondo Commission. Um, then there's the issue of uh, delinking or trying to protect HODs from uh, the political administrative interface or trying to manage that uh, part. Then there's a big uh, change that we are proposing, which is the uh, uh, involvement of the Public Service Commission to in, in, the, in the recruitment, especially of DDGs and HODs, as well as the management of the performance management system uh, or the performance assessments of, uh, of, of senior officials. And then obviously that issue of um, uh, consequence management when we talk about uh, non-performance. Um, so the areas that we have uh, uh, resolved to, to target in terms of the agreement or the responses by the president are that the skills development as a, or skills development or the targeting of skills development has to be based on the weaknesses that have been uh, identified in the in the in the, in the in the in the in the in the recommendations and this links directly to the issue around skills demand and skills supply the linkages that are required there and the biggest the top three of those were project management supply chain management and leadership and these cross um, uh, uh, across the board we also need to look at how we modernize the state, especially around integration of uh, ICT systems, uh, skills development, deployment of skills across this, uh, the public service, and making sure that if we train someone on ICT, they are going to be working in ICT and they're not uh, made to be copying paper or something uh, like that. And obviously it speaks to the integrated system, which links directly to the speech that, or to the presentation that the two last speakers made. And um, the other issue that I think we need to really look at is about the targeted approach to governance and the building of state capacity. And lastly, I'm going to uh, speak to this one. I'm not going to speak to the other one. I think we are going to share the presentations with everyone. Uh, is that when we look at the uh, HR, these are the areas that as HR officials, you are supposed to be responsible for and try to address. There's the issue of coordination, both within departments, government, as well as clusters or sectors of society. And that's why I kept on saying that these are the things that are linking to all the areas that we have been listening to today. There's an issue of discipline, accountability, and consequence management. The issue of dealing with unethical conduct and corruption, especially in public administration. Uh, there's the issue of uh, procurement systems that are a breeding ground for uh, compliance systems, rather, not uh, procurement. Uh, because when you, you, you create uh, systems that are more about compliance and, rigid, and, and are rigid, they breed uh, corruption because then you have you give people an opportunity or what you call opportunistic corruption where someone says i can fast track a certain decision for you uh, to do to get the certain things um, and then we have to move from the administrative approach to hr to, HR to that of a de developmental and uh, obviously the issue of sms collective uh, on what is an association the leadership uh, level that we need to do and address lastly the issue of the high personal cost for personal behavior. So when we talk about whistleblowing, people that are uh, 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 responding or uh, uh, what do you call this, um, uh, that are witnesses uh, in uh, disciplinary cases, how do we protect those and how do we give them access to protection? Uh, and, and so forth. I think I, I I'll leave it at this one so that we don't uh, waste time that you need to spend on lunch, but what we are going to do is have more discussion in the commissions. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, and thank you, uh, Jonathan Van Lyon. Um, so colleagues, I'd like to, I've got four announcements for you. Uh, the first one being the QR code outside. We have noted that some of you have not been making use of the QR code outside to register. It's directly outside the rooms on uh, 
uh, sheets of paper uh, stuck to the wall, please ensure that you register. Um, lunch will start uh, now as soon as I stop talking and end at quarter past two, where you can either come back to this room to find out where the breakaways are, or you can make note of it now so that the officials, um, Naledi, Pugisho, Lia, and Puleng, will actually direct you to the breakaway rooms after lunch. And the final one being that the Q&A session that we were supposed to have following this, um, this uh, part two is actually moved to the uh, plenary when we come back. That is after the breakaway sessions. So we'll take the breakaway sessions, we'll have questions there, and when we come back to the plenary, we'll take your questions from these sessions, if that's okay. Thank you, colleagues. Enjoy lunch.